Hello and welcome to today's webinar. This is the new Auditor's Report and Critical Audit Matters. Our first speaker today is Megan Zeitzman. Megan? Thank you um, and good afternoon everybody or good morning. Um, I'm Megan Zeitzman, the Chief Auditor and the Director of Professional Standards at the PCOB um, and I'm very pleased to welcome you today to, to, this web, to this webcast on the implementation of the new Auditor Report requirements. Uh, as people are getting ready to communicate CAMS, or I should say as auditors are getting ready to communicate CAMS in auditors reports, I think and as many of you know, our board is very committed to supporting the effective implementation of these new requirements. So to that end, we've, we have formed within the PCOB an interdivisional working group where we have representatives from our uh, Department of Registrations and Inspections as well as our um, Office of Economic Analysis together with our folks in OGC and, and um, and the Office of the Chief Auditor working together to really uh, think about how to monitor the implementation of these new requirements um, and then to be ready to communicate relevant and timely information uh, to, to our stakeholders uh, with, with, with this, in, with, in this regard. Um, our staff is working closely with um, many of the large audit firms uh, to understand the actions that firms have been taking to get ready to implement these new requirements um, and we're also engaging with audit committees to understand their level of involvement in what the firms are planning uh, with respect to implementation efforts. So we, the board and the staff are really trying to use a variety of, of avenues to provide useful information, resources and training to auditors and other stakeholders. So these include um, these efforts include promoting awareness and then and also trying to provide direction through staff guidance, webinars such as this, um, and ongoing external engagement. Uh, so I think as some of you may also realize or know, uh, we've recently published some um, guidance documents which summarize some of the things that we've been up to and attempt to provide a little bit of additional information to auditors and others about these new requirements. Um, so we will be overviewing some of those as we're going uh, today. So we're very pleased to offer this webinar on CAMS. It's going to cover the, re the new requirements that relate to the determination, communication of CAMS as well as overview of the documentation requirements. I'm very happy to kick it off. Um, so I know we have a, a large audience waiting to hear what we have to say. So we really do appreciate all the interest. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer to start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. I am Jennifer Rand, a Deputy Chief Auditor in the Office of the Chief Auditor. And presenting with me today are Lana Boschkova and Ekaterina Disna, also from the Office of the Chief Auditor. The three of us have worked on the Auditor Reporting Model Project for many years. We're excited to offer this webinar in CAMS. All three of our CAM webinars will cover the same material. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on the PCOB's website. I'd like to first cover a few administrative matters. The webinar is CPE eligible. If you'd like to receive CPE credit, you'll need to respond to the polling questions and we'll have polling questions throughout today's session. If you respond to the polling questions and, 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 they're, and meet the CPE eligibility requirements, you'll receive a CPE certificate by email from us approximately seven to 10 days after today's webinar. If you'd like to submit questions um, to us during today's webinar, you can go to the website listed um, on, on the slides, and so that's pcaob.cnf.io. You'll then need to click on today's date and on the plus sign in the social Q&A. After you enter your question, you need to click click submit, and your questions will be directed to me and the other presenters. We'll be answering questions throughout the webinar. You may want to go ahead and write this website down now, but we've also added the address on slides throughout the presentation, so you'll see that again, but please feel free to submit questions if you do have any. If you happen to experience any technology issues during the webinar, I'd encourage you to please email Melissa Haas at haasm at pcobus.org. You may want to write down this down this email now if, um, if just to the extent you may need to use it during the webinar. We will not have that um, email address posted again. So again, it's haasm at pcobus.org. 
Regarding evaluations, we'll email you a link to an evaluation for you to complete after the webinar. We appreciate your feedback as it helps us to improve our future webinars. So really look forward to re your feedback on our webinar today. Now, the last thing I'd like, I'd like to mention um, is regarding the slides. You all should have received the slides from us by email yesterday. Um, if you have not received the slides by any chance, I'd encourage you to check your spam folder to the extent they might be there, but they were sent, sent to all participants that registered yesterday. So before we go into the details, I'd like to remind everyone that the views expressed by the presenters are their own personal views and not necessarily those of the PCOB, members of the board, or the PCOB staff. So let's move into today's program. This slide includes the learning objectives for today's webinar. After completing this training, participants will be able to describe the requirements for determination, communication, and documentation of CAMs, and also locate the resources and tools available on the PCB's website to assist with CAM implementation. So let's go over today's topics. We'll start with a brief overview, including discussion of the effective date and applicability of the CAM requirements. Then we'll dive in and spend most of the time going over the requirements themselves, specifically focusing on how to determine, communicate, and document CAMs. We'll also cover additional considerations, including the role of the engagement quality reviewer, as well as interactions with the audit committee. At the end of this presentation, we'll provide a list of resources available to help with CAM implementation. So auditors will soon be required to communicate CAMs in the auditor's report under the new standard AS3101. Under the standard, CAM requirements are effective for audits of large accelerated filers for fiscal years ending on or after June 30th, 2019, and all other companies to which the requirements apply for fiscal years ending on or after December 15th, 2020. So let's ne next talk about applicability of CAMs. The CAM requirements are generally applicable to audits conducted under PCOB standards. CAMs are not required for audits of SEC registered brokers and dealers, investment companies, except business development companies, benefit plans, and emerging growth companies. The project releases provide more information about why the board decided to exclude these entities. But auditors, auditors of these entities may certainly cho to choose to include CAMs in the auditor's report voluntarily. Since a new auditing standard was adopted, the staff has been actively working to help firms implement all the new CAM requirements as well as understand where additional guidance or support may be helpful. In March 2019, we issued three staff guidance documents consisting of the basics, which provides a high-level overview of CAM requirements, the document on the staff review of audit methodologies, which includes thematic observations that arose from the Office of the Chief Auditor's review of audit firms' CAM methodologies, and the final document is a deeper dive on the determination of CAMs. These documents primarily offer insights for auditors, but the basics document may also be of interest to preparers, audit committees, and investors. The board and staff will continue to monitor CAM implementation and determine if further guidance is needed. In today's program, we'll start off with the CAM requirements from the standard and incorporate, where relevant, points from the recently issued staff guidance. Later on, we'll also cover in some detail selected areas from the CAM determination deeper dive guidance. So let's start off with our first polling question. Um, as I mentioned, important if you're looking for CPE, important to answer our polling questions throughout. So our first polling question is, how many large accelerated filers will be first impacted by the CAM requirements for June 30th, 2019 fiscal year ends? Is it five, 50, or more than 70? The polling is open now, so in, input your response. 
I see most people have gone to number three. All right, the correct answer is number three. There are over 70 large accelerated filers with fiscal years ending on um, June 30th, 2019. The auditors of these filers will issue the first wave of auditors reports communicating CAMs. So with that, let me turn over to Elena to kick off the discussion on CAMs. Thank you, Jennifer. First, let's look at the definition of a CAM. A CAM is a matter arising from the audit of the financial statements that, one, was communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee, two, relates to accounts or disclosures that are material to the financial statements, and three, involve especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment. So as the definition says, CAMs are determined from matters arising from the audit of the financial statements and thus they're rooted in the financial statements themselves. We will walk through each element of the definition in the next few slides. It's important to remember that in order to be a CAM, a matter needs to meet all three elements of the definition. So let's start with the, the first element communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee. CAMs are drawn from matters required to be communicated to the audit committee, even if they were not actually communicated, and for matters actually communicated, even if not required. The source of CAMs includes auditor communication requirements under our standard on communications with audit committees, AS 1301, under other PCOB rules and standards, and applicable law, as well as communications made to the audit committee that were not required. Um, an important point on this element of the definition is that the standard does not exclude any required audit committee communications from the source of CAMs. Let's move on to the second element of the definition. The second element is relates to accounts or disclosures that are material to the financial statements. So in this part of the definition, relates to clarifies that a CAM may relate to a component of a material account or disclosure and does not necessarily need to correspond to the entire account or disclosure in the financial statements. Additionally, a CAM could have a pervasive effect on the financial statements if it relates to many accounts or disclosures. And on the other hand, a matter that does not relate to an account or disclosure that are material to the financial statements cannot be a CAM. Elena, this is an important element of the definition, and I thought it'd be helpful if we could walk through some examples. So let's say I'm evaluating management's impairment assessment for one of the company's long-lived assets. My evaluation involved especially challenging subjective or complex judgment. Let's say in the end I determine that there is no impairment. Could my evaluation of this impairment assessment be a CAM? The answer is yes. The auditor may determine that a CAM exists even if there is no impairment. The CAM would relate to long-lived assets reported on the balance sheet and the disclosures in the notes to the financial statements about the company's impairment policy and long-lived assets. So here's another example. Potential loss contingency for which management reported an accrual or made a disclosure could potentially be a CAM. However, a potential loss contingency which was not recorded in the financial statements or otherwise disclosed would not be a CAM because it would not relate to an account or disclosure that is material to the financial statements. Our recently issued staff guidance provides other examples as well. So let's move on to the third element of the definition. The auditor is required to determine in the context of the specific audit that a matter involved especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment. The determination of CAMS is principles-based and the standard does not specify any items that would always constitute CAMS. Generally, CAMs stand out from the other numerous matters addressed during the audit because of the challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment they require. 
In some aspects of an audit are inherently more challenging, subjective, or complex than others, and are more likely to meet the criteria for CAMS when they arise. Other aspects of an audit may involve especially challenging, subjective, or complex judgments uh, only in the context of a particular issuer, transaction, or circumstance. Especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment is assessed in the context of the many judgments the auditor makes in the course of conducting the audit. The standard uses the word especially instead of most, as was originally proposed, to convey more clearly that there could be multiple CAMs and that matters are assessed on a relative basis within the specific audit. So for example, a matter that was a CAM in a previous period would not cease to be a CAM just because another matter arose in the current period that required even more challenging subjective or complex auditor judgment. If both mat matters involve especially challenging subjective or complex auditor judgment in the current period, the auditor would identify both as CAMs. In the deeper dive guidance on CAM determination, we address a question about whether the auditor needs to consider each of the criteria in the CAM definition when determining CAMs. And the answer to that question is yes. A CAM may involve especially challenging auditor judgment, especially subjective auditor judgment, especially complex auditor judgment, or some combination of these. The new standard provides a list of factors for the auditor to use in assessing whether a matter involved especially challenging subjective or complex auditor judgment. And I will go over those factors next. So this slide includes the topics of the factors and the standard describes them in greater detail. Uh, the topics cover risks of material misstatements, including significant risks, significant unusual transactions, the nature and extent of audit effort, and the nature of audit evidence. The factor on the nature and extent of audit effort includes the use of specialists and consultations outside of the engagement team. So the factors provide a principles-based framework for the auditor to use in assessing whether a matter involved especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment. Depending on the matter, the auditor's determination that a matter is a CAM might be based on one or more of these factors, on other factors specific to the audit, or on a combination of factors. So with respect to significant risks, it is not expected that all significant risks will give rise to CAMs, or that all CAMs will necessarily be related to an identified significant risk. This is the case because the factors relevant to identifying significant risks overlap with but are, are not identical to the criteria that apply in determining CAMs. So let me provide an example here. If responding to a significant risk, for example, the risk, presumed fraud risk for improper revenue recognition, uh, if that response did not involve especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment, the auditor would not determine that a related CAM exists. On the other hand, though, we could have a CAM that will not necessarily relate to a significant risk. So let me pause here um, so Jennifer could address a few questions on the determination of CAMs. Thanks, Elena. Um, yes, questions have come to us regarding the determination of CAMs that um, thought it would be helpful to address here since we've been talking about determination. So the first question is, would a single factor be enough to determine that a matter is a CAM? So Elena, you just went over the factors. Um, so I would start off um, with kind of, as you know, CAMs involve especially challenging subjective or complex judgment. So in determining whether um, those criteria apply, the auditor should take into account the factors included in the standard that Elena just covered. Those factors can be taken into account alone or in combination. So yes, a single factor can certainly result in a matter being identified as a CAM. Also, the list of factors in the standard is not exclusive. So in addition to the listed factors, the auditor should also take into account other factors that may be specific to the audit. 
Let's see, the next question um, I'd like to address is, will the requirement to communicate CAMs result in the auditor performing an audit differently in the area of the CAM? Um, so we've talked about kind of the communicate determination requirements and here is around work effort. Um, so we certainly did not intend that the auditor would have to do anything differently in the area of the CAM. The standard does not impose any new auditor performance requirements other than the determination, communication, and documentation of CAMs, which are based on the work the auditor has already performed. And I'll take one more question. Um, before turning it back to you, Elena. Um, so that next question is, when should CAMs be identified during the audit? Do auditors need to wait until the end of the audit to identify which matters are the de meet the definition of CAM? So, so far we've talked about the determination process, but we haven't talked about um, kind of the timing um, when that process should occur in connection with the um, audit process. Um, so we certainly believe that CAMs can be identified at any point in the audit process. Some matters may be identified as meeting the definition of a CAM early in the audit, while others may be identified toward the end of the audit. There could be last minute issues that occur. But overall, there's no need to wait until the end of the audit to identify CAMs. We've also heard from some of the larger firms who've been performing dry runs that starting early dialogue with management and the audit committee about areas of possible CAMs has also been um, very helpful. So we encourage auditors to start identifying CAMs early in the audit and to engage with the audit committees and management early and often. So with that, Elena, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Jennifer. So next we have a polling question about the factors that we just discussed. So the question is, can the auditor take into account factors other than those listed in the standard when determining if a matter is a CAM? Simple yes or no answer. So if you can go ahead and submit your answer. Okay, so it looks like um, we have the yes answer for most of you, and that is correct. The auditor can, and in, in fact, the standard says that the auditor should take into account other factors specific to the audit when determining CAMs. So next, I will address some questions that previously came to us. We provided the answers to these questions in the recent deeper dive guidance on CAM determination. The first question is, should CAM determinations be consistent across auditors, or will CAMs vary depending on the auditor? So as you know, some aspects of an audit are inherently more challenging, subjective, or complex than others, regardless of the auditor's experience, knowledge, and resources. So such matters may be determined to be CAMs even when the auditor has ample experience and access to specialists, the ability to consult the national office, and other resources. So for example, accounting estimates generally involve subjective assumptions and measurement uncertainty and may involve complex methods. So regardless of the characteristics of the auditor, these attributes of estimates may affect the degree of auditor judgment or the degree of auditor subjectivity in applying procedures and evaluating results. The requirements for determining CAMs are, however, principles-based and should be applied in the context of the facts and circumstances of the specific audit. So differences in auditor's judgment, as well as differences in the nature, timing, and extent of the audit response required in the specific circumstances will influence the determination of CAMs. The second question relates to whether CAMs are expected to vary from year to year or should they be constant? Um, depending on the circumstances, some matters may be CAMs each year, while others may be CAMs in a single period or in some periods, but not others. Um, let me illustrate. The implementation of a new accounting standard 
may require especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment in the year in which it occurs, but not after that. CAMs may also recur from year to year. So for example, the audit of deferred tax asset accounts and disclosures may involve especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgments in years when additional auditor judgment and effort is necessary to assess the company's ability to utilize net operating loss carry forwards. And the last question on this slide is intended to address how auditors should think about significant events that can occur and whether they can be camps. So we received a number of questions about significant events and whether they can be camps. For example, can a cybersecurity breach be a CAM? Could implementation of a new accounting standard be a CAM? Or could the impact of Brexit, for example, on the company's financial statements be a CAM? So rather than addressing these situations individually, where the results may vary, we provided a framework for the auditor to use to evaluate whether a situation can result in a CAM. First, when evaluating events for the of determining CAMs, the auditor would consider whether the event affected the financial statements and became the subject of communications between the auditor and the audit committee. Then the auditor would evaluate the impact of the event on the audit, which will largely depend on the nature, timing, and extent of the audit response required to address any affected accounts or disclosures. And the question is always whether the matter resulted in especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment. So this next slide includes a couple of other questions that have been raised about CAMs. The first one deals with how to think about a material weakness or significant deficiency in internal control over financial reporting when determining CAMs. The evaluation and determination process for control deficiencies, whether for an integrated audit or an audit of the financial statements only, does not relate to a financial statement account or disclosure. So the evaluation of the severity of, of control deficiencies, which includes determining whether a material weakness or significant deficiency exists, would not in and of itself be a CAM. Um, when a control deficiency exists, the auditor needs to consider whether and how the auditor might need to adjust the original audit plan, or in other words, the audit response. The audit response to material weakness could be extensive, since the auditor has concluded a reasonable possibility of material misstatement exists. For significant deficiencies and other less severe control deficiencies, the required audit response may be less extensive. So if auditing, an affected account balance or disclosure involved especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment, the auditor would determine one or more camps. The control deficiency could be among the considerations that led the auditor to determine that a camp exists. If a significant deficiency was among the principal considerations in determining that a matter was a camp, the auditor would describe the relevant control-related issues over the matter in the broader context of the CAM without using the term significant deficiency. For material weaknesses, there is reporting by the company, so there would be no sensitivity around using that term in a CAM description. And the last question I will address is about the relationship between CAMs and a company's disclosures regarding critical accounting estimates. The critical accounting estimates for which management is required to provide disclosure may overlap with CAMs, but they are not the same thing. They have different definitions and objectives. And while some critical accounting estimates or components of those estimates may be the subject of CAMs, not all critical accounting estimates necessarily would be for several reasons. So the source of CAMs, which is all matters communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee, is broader than just critical accounting estimates. And the auditor may identify matters as CAMs
that have not been identified as critical accounting estimates. The responses to these questions are included in the deeper dive guidance on CAM determination. So now let me turn it over to Ekaterina for the next polling question. Selena. So we're going to turn your attention to the polling question to get you thinking about CAM communication requirements. So the question is, um, for what period are CAMs required to be communicated? One, current period only. Two, current and prior periods. And three, all periods presented in the financial statements. Please go ahead and submit your answers. I'm going to give a few more seconds. All right, looks like the answers are in, and the correct answer is one, the current period only. So I'm going to advance to the next slide and describe this requirement in um, more detail. So the standard requires that KMs be communicated only for the current audit period. When the current period's financial statements are presented on a comparative basis with those of one or more prior periods, the auditor may communicate CAMs relating to a prior period. The standard includes a couple of examples. Uh, the first example is when the prior period's financial statements are made public for the first time. So that would be an example of initial public offering. And the second example is when the auditor is issuing an auditor's report on the prior period's financial statements following a restatement where the previously issued auditor's report could no longer be relied upon. So that's another example of when the auditor may communicate CAMs relating to a prior period. Uh, with that, let's move on to the CAM communication requirement. So here it is. When communicating CAMs in the auditor's report, um, the auditor is required to identify the CAM, describe the principal considerations that led the auditor to determine that the matter is a CAM, describe how the CAM was addressed in the audit, and refer to the relevant financial statement accounts or disclosures that relate to the CAM. So we're going to take a similar approach as we just did with CAM determination and spend more time on each of the elements of the communication requirement. Um, starting from the top, um, the auditor is required to identify the CAM and describe the principal considerations that led to the determination that a matter is a CAM. So a few considerations on this element. Uh, first, the auditor's description should be specific to the circumstances. It should provide a clear, concise, and understandable discussion of why. Why the matter involved especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment. Auditors are expected to tailor CAM communications to the audit to avoid standardized language and to reflect the specific circumstances of the matter. For this CAM communication element, simply stating that a CAM was especially challenging, especially subjective, or especially complex, or some combination of those, does not fulfill the requirement of the standard without specific language explaining why, why the matter involved especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment. So moving to the next element of the communication requirement, the auditor is required to describe how the CAM was addressed in the audit. Um, the standard includes four elements that the auditor can use for this description. Uh, these elements are listed here and can be used individually or in combination. So for example, the auditor could provide their response or approach that was most relevant to the matter, or the auditor could provide brief overview of the procedures performed. The auditor could also provide an indication of the outcome of the audit procedures or key observations with respect to the matter. The objective is to provide a summary that is useful to investors. 
and not to detail every aspect of how the CAM was addressed in the audit. So if the auditor chooses to describe audit procedures, the descriptions are expected to be at a level that readers would understand. In addition, limiting the use of highly technical accounting and auditing terms when describing CAMs, particularly if the auditor chooses to describe audit procedures, may help financial statement users better understand CAMs in relation to the audit of the financial statements. Now, a final point on this communication element is that language that could be viewed as disclaiming, qualifying, restricting, or minimizing the auditor's responsibility for the CAMs or the auditor's opinion on the financial statements. That language is not appropriate and may not be used. The language used to communicate a CAM also should not imply that the auditor is providing a separate opinion on the CAM or on the accounts or disclosures to which they relate. I'd like to jump in here because um, this is an important area for how a CAM is described. And so you just went over four different ways where auditors can um, provide that description or how they can provide it. In thinking through um, different matters that may be CAMs, I could imagine the testing of internal controls could be a common response in an area subject to a CAM. So if that's the case, how, how should an auditor, or how would an auditor um, describe internal control testing? Can you kind of use that as an example to kind of walk through some of the considerations? Sure. So as I mentioned, auditors are expected to tailor CAM communications to the audit um, to avoid standardized language and to reflect the specific circumstances of the matter. And financial statement users will likely find a CAM communication more useful if the procedures described are linked to the principal considerations that led the matter to be identified as a CAM. So for example, if the auditor just decides to include control testing in the description of how the CAM was addressed in the audit, the auditor would describe the testing of the relevant controls. General statements about procedures that would likely be performed in most audits or in relation to most significant areas of the audit, such as testing the operating effectiveness of the company's controls in the case of an integrated audit. Such statements do not by themselves provide useful information to a reader about how the auditor addressed the CAM in the particular audit. Katarina, that's very helpful. Um, so my takeaway from that is if auditors decide to include internal control testing in the description of how the CAM was addressed in the audit, they should tailor the description of controls as opposed to providing general statements about control testing. So hopefully that, hopefully that was helpful. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Okay, so finally, when communicating CAMs, uh, the auditor is required to refer to the relevant financial statement accounts or disclosures. Now, an important consideration for this element is that CAM may relate to one or more accounts or disclosures, or both. Hey, Katarina, I'd like to jump in again. We've received questions about the interaction between CAM communications and the company's disclosures. So on the slide, it says that the CAM has to refer to financial statement accounts or disclosures. But what if there's also disclosure about the matter outside the financial statements, such as in the MD&A? What is the interaction between CAMs and the company's disclosures outside the financial statements? In communicating CAMs, um, auditors are required to refer to the relevant financial statement um, accounts or disclosures rather than to disclosures outside the financial statements. Company disclosures outside of financial statements may, however, be relevant in the context of CAM communication. When describing CAMs in the auditor's report, um, the auditor is not expected to provide information about the company that has not been made publicly available by the company unless the information is necessary to describe the principal considerations that led the auditor to determine that a matter is a CAM or how the matter was addressed in the audit. Uh, also bear in mind that information a company has made publicly available, um, that includes all means of public communication, 
whether within or outside the financial statements, uh, including SEC filings, press releases, and other uh, public statements. Katarina, there's a few other questions on CAM communications that I'll go ahead and address here. So one question is um, about boilerplate language. Some people are concerned that CAM communication could turn into, into boilerplate. And so the question is, what does the board plan to do to prevent or address this? Um, so I, first I would say that both the board and the SEC have stressed that it's important that CAMs not become boilerplate. It's certainly our expectation that the communication of CAMs will be tailored to the audit to avoid standardized language and to reflect the specific circumstances of the matter. The requirements for CAMs are principles-based, and so in order to comply with these requirements, the auditor would consider and communicate the specific facts and circumstances that existed during the audit, both in terms of the auditor's principal considerations um, that led the auditor to determine that a matter is a CAM, um, as well as how the auditor addressed the CAM in the audit. We certainly plan to actively monitor CAM implementation and share observations and issue guidance as necessary. Um, another question I'll address um, is, if a CAM is recurring, how should auditors apply the CAM communication requirements? So this is great, people are already thinking ahead to the next CAMs. Um, um, but certainly, um, we imagine that for recurring CAMs, the communication may be the same year to year, or it may vary, really depends on the circumstances. The auditor determines and communicates CAMs every year in connection with the current period audit. So it's possible that a CAM identified in one or more prior periods um, may continue to be a CAM in the current period. And a CAM could be determined based on the same or different circumstances, and the way a CAM is addressed in the audit may be similar or may vary. So regardless of whether a matter was previously determined to be a CAM, the auditor would consider the specific facts and circumstances that existed during the audit of the current period's financial statements and tailor the communication of the CAM as necessary. Um, another question um, has to do with CAM examples. So the question is, does the PCOB plan to provide example CAMs for auditors to use as guidance? Um, so we do not have plans to provide CAM examples. The standard um, does provide a principles-based framework for the auditor to use to determine whether a matter is a CAM, and the determination depends on the facts and circumstances of each audit. Since the objective of CAMs is to provide tailored audit-specific information, um, illustrative examples were not included in the adopting release. Um, some may have already identified that um, the PCB did provide example CAMs in the reproposing release, but those examples were not intended to function as templates for how CAMs should be communicated, and comments on those examples were taken into account in the final standard. The last question I'll take before I turn it back to you, Ekaterina, is, um, is there a specific order in which CAM should appear in the auditor's report? So we haven't talked about that um, so far. Um, so AS3101 does not specify any particular order of presentation for matters included within the CAM section of the auditor's report. The auditor may consider ordering the presentation of CAMs um, based on the auto and judgment of relative importance based on an order that corresponds to the presentation of the company's financial statements or any other order. So flexibility there. So with that, Ekaterina, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Jennifer. When communicating CAMs in the auditor's report, um, the auditor is required to include introductory language in the critical audit meta section of the auditor's report. Um, this language is included in the blue box on the slide. It provides a definition of CAMs and indicates that CAMs do not alter the opinion on financial statements. It also says that the auditor is not providing a separate opinion on the CAMs or on the accounts or disclosures to which CAMs relate. Now, if the auditor communicates CAMs for prior periods, 
the introductory language should be modified to indicate the periods to which the CAMs relate. So in the first sentence of the introductory language, um, that's where the auditor um, would make that change. So here we have another polling question. It's a yes or no question. Can an audit have no CAMs? Please go ahead and submit your answers. All right, looks like most of the participants got this question right. So the correct answer is yes. So let's talk about audits with no CAMs. The standard recognizes that there may be circumstances in which the auditor determines that there are no matters that meet the definition of a CAM. And in those circumstances, the auditor will communicate that there were no CAMs. The required language um, included in the blue box on the slide, um, this language is different from when CAMs are communicated. The language provides a definition of CAMs and states that the auditor determined that there are no CAMs. Katarina, we received a question on the number of CAMs. So I thought it would be helpful to provide a response to this, to this question. Um, so specifically, the question is, is there an average number or range of number of CAMs per audit that the PCOB expects? Or Katerina, can you address that one? Um, sure. So there is no average number or range of number of CAMs per audit. Uh, the number of matters that are reported as CAMs, um, that number will depend on the complexity of the company's financial reporting and the audit. There may be CAMs even in the audit of a company with limited operations or activities. Or as I mentioned, uh, there may be circumstances in which the auditor determines that there are no CAMs. What is most important is for the auditor to apply the requirements of the standard in the context of the specific audit. So with that, we have another point question. Um, the question is, when the matter meets the definition of a CAM and also requires an explanatory paragraph, only the CAM communication is required in the auditor's report. It's a true and false question. Please go ahead and submit your answers. Gonna give a few more seconds for everyone to get their answers in. All right, looks like every, most everyone got the question right. So the correct answer is two, uh, false. Um, both the explanatory paragraph and the CAM communication are required. So let's move on to the next slide for more information on the interaction between CAMs and explanatory paragraphs. There could be situations in which a matter meets a definition of a CAM and also requires an explanatory paragraph. So for these situations, both the explanatory paragraph and the required communication regarding the CAM would be provided. Now, the auditor could include the required CAM communication in the explanatory paragraph with a cross-reference to the CAM section. Or the auditor could provide both a CAM and an explanatory paragraph. So there are options here. AS3101 includes a list of circumstances when explanatory paragraphs are required. These situations include when there's substantial doubt about a company's ability to continue as a going concern or when a material misstatement in previously issued financial statements has been corrected. So kind of reflecting on those two as examples, how would the CAM reporting requirements of the standard apply in these situations? 
So in both of your examples, Jennifer, an explanatory paragraph is required following the opinion paragraph. Um, if these matters were also determined to be CAMs, um, the auditor has the option of including the CAM communication in the explanatory paragraph uh, with a cross-reference in the CAMs section to the explanatory paragraph. Or alternatively, the auditor may include the explanatory paragraph and the CAM communication separately uh, with a cross-reference between the two sections. So next, I'd like to cover emphasis paragraphs. Um, emphasis paragraphs are not required, um, but may be used by auditors to draw the reader's attention to matters such as significant transactions with related parties, or if there is an unusually important subsequent event that auditor decides to emphasize. Now, if a matter that the auditor considers emphasizing meets the definition of a CAM, the auditor would provide the information required for a CAM and would not be expected to include an emphasis paragraph in the auditor's report. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Elena to discuss the CAM documentation requirements. Thanks, Ekaterina. So this next slide lays out the documentation requirement. The objective of the requirement is to document how the auditor determined whether matters communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee and that relate to accounts or disclosures that are material to the financial statements or accounts. Consistent with the requirements of our audit documentation standard AS 1215, the audit documentation is required to be in sufficient detail to enable an experienced auditor with no previous connection with the engagement to understand the determinations made. And here are uh, some additional points on CAM documentation. For matters determined to be CAMs, the description in the auditor's report will generally suffice as documentation. And that's because the description in the report will include the principal considerations that led the auditor to determine that a matter was a CAM. For matters determined not to be CAMs, the amount of documentation required could vary with the circumstances. So a single sentence may be sufficient, for instance, when the auditor's documentation prepared in the course of the audit includes sufficient detail about why the matter did not involve especially challenging subjective or complex auditor judgment. And other matters may require more extensive documentation. Elena, I'd like to um, pause here since we previously received a question about the level of required documentation for items that seem less likely to be CAMs. So our response to this is that the level of documentation could certainly vary. Um, we understand that some firms may de be developing tools and templates to assist engagement teams with the documentation of the determination of CAMs, including documenting, documenting how the matters communicated to the audit committee have been considered in the process. We understand this may be helpful in streamlining the process and that some items may be less likely to give rise to CAMs. However, a couple points that it's important to keep in mind. One, one is that no matters communicated to the audit committee are excluded from the process of determining CAMs. And also, as, a, as Elena just mentioned, the audit documentation needs to comply with the requirements of AS 1215, including sufficient detail to enable an experienced auditor with no previous connection to the engagement to understand the determinations made to comply with the standard. So with that, Elaine, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, there are a few other considerations related to the CAM requirements that I would like to cover next. And the first one is the role of the engagement quality reviewer. As you know, the objective of the EQR is to perform an evaluation of the significant judgments made by the engagement team and the related conclusions reached in forming the overall conclusions on the engagement and in preparing the auditor's report. The EQR is required to evaluate the engagement team's determination, communication, and documentation of CAMS in accordance with AS 3101. 
The documentation of CAMS by the engagement team will also facilitate review by the EQR. The second topic is uh, the interaction between the auditor and the audit committee. So any matter communicated as a CAM will already have been discussed with the audit committee. And as the auditor determines how best to comply with the communication requirements, the auditor could discuss with management and the audit committee the treatment of any sensitive information. And so while the auditor is required to provide to and discuss with the audit committee a draft of the auditor's report, and a dialogue regarding CAMS is expected, auditors need to remember that CAMS are the responsibility of the auditor, not the audit committee. So let me pause again here to see if there are any more questions. Jennifer? Thanks, Elena. Um, yes, there's a, a few more questions that I'll um, take time to address now. Um, the first one is, what happens if management has concerns with the CAMS or the CAM description, or believes there should be no CAMs. Um, so Elena just talked about um, interactions with the audit committee, so this question is about management. Um, so, the, so I would start off with the determination and communication of CAMs are the auditor's responsibilities. As such, CAMs are grounded in the auditor's expertise and judgment and are intended to present information from the auditor's point of view. As the auditor determines how best to comply with the new requirements, we certainly believe the auditor would likely have discussions with management, including about any concerns management may have about the treatment of any sensitive information. But as Elena just said, ultimately, it's the auditor's responsibility to issue a report in compliance with the PCAB standards, including by communicating CAMS appropriately. And the next question I'll address now is, how are CCAMs different from KCAMs? Um, so before I get into the answer to this question, I'd like to provide a little background for those who are not um, familiar with KCAMs. So in 2014, the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, or the IAASB, adopted changes to the requirements for the auditor's report, including a new requirement for the auditor to communicate key audit matters or KCAMs. So key audit matters are defined as those matters that in the auditor's professional judgment were of most significance in the audit of the financial statements of the current period. So it's possible that foreign private issuers in jurisdictions that have adopted the IAASB requirements would have to report under both standards and thus have KCAMs and CCAMs. So now to get to the answer to the question, how are CCAMs different from KCAMs? So both the PCOB and the IAASB standards require the auditor to use audit committee communications as a starting point for sources of communications. But the underlying requirements are different. The standards have different definitions. CCAMs focus on matters involving especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment while KCAMs focus on matters that were of most significance during the audit. The standards have similar processes for determining CCAMs and KCAMs and similar reporting requirements, but while the objective of both is to communicate information about the audit, due to the differences in the definition and the underlying requirements, it's possible that differences could result in what is communicated or how matters are described in the auditor's report. However, we also anticipate that many of the same matters could be communicated under both approaches. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Elena, um, to talk about resources. Thanks, Jennifer. So this slide lists a number of publications that we think would be useful in the implementation of the new auditor reporting standard. And all of these resources are available on the PCOB's new auditor's report page and the link to that page is in the blue box on the slide. The web page includes um, the actual standard 3101 and the related adopting release. Uh, it also has the SEC's approval order. It includes the recently issued staff guidance on the implementation of CAMS, including the three documents, the basics, the staff observations from review of audit methodologies and the deeper dive on the determination of CAMS. 
It also has some other staff guidance documents that were previously issued. And to the extent that any other guidance is issued, it will be posted on this page. You can also subscribe to receive email updates on PCOB research, standard setting, and implementation projects on this page. So Jennifer, back to you for responding to any final questions. Um, thanks, Elaine. I guess we have some questions that have come in, so we'll take time to address it. And I'll, um, I'll also ask Elena and Ekaterina to help in responding to some of the questions. But I'll start um, with a couple questions first. So the first one is, when should auditors of smaller companies start preparing for CAMs? Um, so CAMs will be required first for audits of large accelerated filers. And most of these types of companies are audited by large accounting firms. The later effective date for all other public companies will allow auditors of these companies to benefit from the experiences of auditors of larger companies. That said, we think there's a lot of preparation and learning that can already begin so that auditors will be ready when the time comes. And the next question I'll address is, what have you heard from investors in terms of how they will use CAMs? So certainly CAMs are intended to benefit investors. And investors and investor advocates have suggested a variety of ways in which investors can use the information provided in CAMs. So I'll um, go over some of, those, some of those ways. So first, CAMs will add to the total mix of information providing insights relevant in analyzing and pricing risks and capital valuation and allocation and contributing to investors' ability to make investment decisions. CAMS will also focus investor attention on key financial reporting areas and identify areas that um, deserve more attention, enhancing the efficiency of investors and others in the consumption of financial information. We've also heard that CAMS will highlight areas for investors that they may wish to emphasize in their engagement with the company. And then finally, CAMS will provide important information that investors can use in making proxy voting decisions, including ratification of the appointment of auditors. So CAMS are intended to enhance the auditor's report, to provide audit-specific information that's meaningful to investors and other financial statement users. And we encourage auditors to keep in mind the purpose of CAMS when complying with the new requirements. So next I'll move on to a question about CAM determination. And Elena, I'll look for you to help address this question. So uh, um, the question is related to management disclosures. And the question specifically is, could CAMS affect management disclosures? Can you talk about that? Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, the communication of CAMS in an audit is an auditor reporting requirement. And so there is no requirement for management to modify its financial reporting disclosures. But since the auditor will be providing reference to the relevant financial statement accounts or disclosures that relate to the CAM, management may choose to revisit its disclosures. Great. Thanks, Elena. I have another question um, that I'll look for your help on. So the question relates to the, um, something I talked about at the beginning of, of the webinar, which was the thematic review of firm methodologies that we performed. Um, so Elena, could you provide more information about the nature of that review? Yes, certainly. So in anticipation of the first phase of the CAM implementation, uh, we in the office of the chief auditor reviewed CAM methodologies, practice aids, training materials, and examples submitted by the 10 U.S. audit firms that collectively audit approximately 85% of the large accelerated filers. And the purpose of our review was to gain insight into how audit firms are preparing for to implement the new CAM requirements and to consider how their materials are aligned with the standard and the discussion in the board's rulemaking releases. Um, the staff review does not mean that the PCOB has approved any audit firm methodology. And as always, it is the responsibility of the audit firm to develop methodologies that comply with PCOB standards. The review by the Office of the Chief Auditor is separate from the PCOB inspections process. 
It does not provide assurance that deficiencies related to CAM requirements will not be identified in a PCOB inspection. And the review also helped to inform us about areas where guidance may be helpful. Thanks, Elena. Thanks. Katarina, I'm going to um, turn it over for your help with a couple of questions um, since you covered communication of CAMs. So let me ask you a few questions related to that. So the first question is, how should CAMs be communicated in a dual dated auditor's report? Sure. So if the auditor's report is dual dated, uh, the new information for which the report is dual dated, um, that information may give rise to one or more additional CAMs, or that information may require modifications to previously communicated CAMs. So for example, um, if an auditor's report is dual dated because of a subsequent event, the report would include any new CAMs or modifications to previously issued CAMs arising from the impact of that subsequent event on the audit. All right, thank you. Um, so the, the next question I'll have you address is, would CAMs affect the audit opinion and cause the auditor to issue a qualified opinion? So talk about the effect of CAMs on the audit. Right, so I've covered this previously when uh, we talked about the required introductory language for CAMs, and that language includes a statement that the communication of CAMs does not alter in any way the auditor's opinion on the financial statements taken as a whole, and the auditor is not, by communicating the CAMs, providing separate opinions on the CAMs or on the accounts or disclosures to which they relate. And the purpose of the statement is to make clear that the communication of CAMs in an auditor's report should not be interpreted as altering the level of assurance on any aspect of the audit report, including the identified CAMs. Also, CAMs are not a substitute for a qualified opinion. All right, thanks, Ekaterina. Um, so let me address a couple more questions. Um, one is how will CAMs be inspected? So this webinar is um, to provide, intended to provide guidance, um, staff guidance related to the CAM requirements. But as we understand, inspection teams would have the first opportunity to review CAMs in the latter part of 2019, starting with audit reports of large accelerated filers, since these are the first audits that will be subject to the CAM requirements for fiscal years ending on or after June 30th, 2019. The PCOB is working to ensure its inspection program is consistent with the new auditor's report requirements, including its principles-based approach and training inspectors on the new requirements. And the next one is, um, I'll take, what is the board plan um, for post-implementation review for CAMS? So once the initial implementation of CAMS begins in June 2019, PCOB staff will perform an interim analysis on the implementation of the standard to assess initial stakeholders' experiences and results. The staff plans to engage with stakeholders, including auditors, investors, financial statement preparers, and audit committee members through interviews, surveys, and other outreach to learn about stakeholders' experience with the new standard. So first you'll see from the PCOB an interim analysis um, and the tenant targets between the two effective dates. And then next, the PCOB will conduct a post-implementation review to analyze the effectiveness of the new requirements. And that'll occur after a reasonable period of time following the completion of implementation in December 2020. The PCOB will reevaluate costs and benefits of the new standard, including any unintended consequences, to understand the overall impact on the auto profession, public companies, and users of financial statements. So we covered a lot of information so far, um, but before we conclude today's presentation, I'd like to provide or have us all provide a few key takeaways. Um, so I'll start with you uh, on key takeaways, Elena, um, since you talked about determination. So can you um, provide some key takeaways with respect to determination of CAMs? Yes, I have two key takeaways for determination of CAMs. So first, it is important to remember that the standard provides a principles-based framework for the auditor to use to determine whether a matter is a CAM 
and the determination depends on the facts and circumstances of each audit. And secondly, the framework is centered on the definition of CAMS and the application of the factors in determining whether the matter involved especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment. Thanks, Elena. Um, so next I'll turn to you, Ekaterina. You talked about CAM communication requirements. So what key takeaways would you provide? Sure, so my key takeaways are when developing a description of a CAM, I would encourage auditors to keep in mind um, that the intent of CAMs is to provide a clear, concise and understandable discussion of why, why the matter is a CAM and how the matter was addressed in the audit. Also remember that CAM communication um, should be tailored to the audit um, to avoid boilerplate language and to reflect the specific circumstances of the matter. Thanks to Katarina. And I would also like to stress that we are monitoring implementation of CAMs and are fully committed to continue promoting awareness and providing direction through staff guidance, webinars, and external engagements. And, and before I move to wrap it up, Megan, I'd like to turn it over to you for any final closing remarks. Great, thanks everybody. Um, and I'd just like to thank everybody for participating today and I hope you've found this to be useful and informative. Um, thanks also for all the questions that were submitted. I think the team's done a good job of addressing uh, many of those questions through uh, through the, the, the throughout the session and then at the end um, in the in the last couple of slides. Um, I really just maybe would reiterate a couple of things. I think there were a number of questions that came in about the number of CAMs that would be expected and is there uh, is it okay to have no CAMs or is there um, some kind of an expected number of CAMs? Um, you know, so I'd just like to really reiterate what, uh, you know, what was said in terms of the importance of remembering first and foremost that the requirements of the standard need to be applied. So this is not intended to be um, an exercise that's driving to a, a, any kind of a preconceived outcome. Um, it, it certainly can be the case that through a thoughtful application of the requirements, a conclusion is reached that there are no CAMs and clearly the standard provides for that. So, um, you know, so that that certainly can be an outcome. Um, but by the same token, there could be one or more or any number of, of, of CAMs. So there isn't a limit in terms of, of how many CAMs you might actually identify through, again, through, through the application of those requirements. So I'd really just like to reiterate that point. Um, and then maybe another sort of theme of questions that I'd just like to comment on other questions around, um, you know, matters that may or may not be be CAMs. Um, and I think some of the things that were mentioned were things like system implementation, group audit scoping, a determination of materiality, uh, you know, those kinds of things. And again, what I'd like to reiterate here is, is that it's important to remember that CAMs need to relate to the, the accounts or disclosures that are material to the financial statements. So, um, you know, that really is a, a, a an important aspect of the CAM definition to remember as you think through these things. Um, it's certainly possible and the staff guidance gets uh, gets into this that um, some of these things might be principal considerations um, or drivers of CAMs so it may certainly be relevant as you think about CAMs but if you can't really relate them to accounts or disclosures that are material uh, you know you're, you're probably not meeting the definition of a CAM. Um, some of them also may be relevant to how CAMs are actually communicated uh, in the auditor's report. So. Um, you know, I think there are, uh, you know, just a couple of things to think about there. Um, I'd also like to emphasize the key takeaways that the team has um, has made uh, for the auditors on the line, especially those who are getting ready for the first CAM communications. Please, to the extent that you're not already up to speed, I would suggest that you uh, you get up to speed with the new requirements. Um, would also encourage you to engage with the audit committees of your audit clients and management um, so that you can uh, be uh, in communication with them so that everyone really has an idea of, of what to expect and you have good plans going into uh, going into the year end um, and the final engagement completion and reporting cycle. So with that, um, I'm going to sign us off for today. Uh, again, we just thank everybody. Thanks to the presenters um, and we look forward to uh, seeing what comes next. Thank you. I'd just like to um, 
um, a couple closing remarks. Um, so again, thank everybody for participating in today's webinar. We hope you found it helpful. As a reminder, we will email, um, email everyone a link to an evaluation. Please take time to complete it. Your feedback helps us to improve future webinars. So with that, thank you and have a great rest of the day.